Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate. If you're enjoying this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a star rating or review, and then share this podcast with others. Previous guests on the show have included Alan Hirsch, Neil Cole, and Curtis Sargent. You could go back and listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is J.D. Payne. J.D. serves as professor of Christian ministry at Samford University. Prior to this, he was the pastor for church multiplication with the church at Brook Hills in Birmingham, Alabama. He's the author of many books in the area of missions, evangelism, and church growth, and is also the host of the podcast Strike the Match. We have a really great conversation on apostolic imagination, missions, and church planting. Enjoy it. JD, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Hey, brother. It is an honor and a delight to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, I'm excited to to jump in and, and talk to you about uh, missions, apostolic imagination, church planting. Uh, but I'd love to start with your story. How did your your passion of missions, church planting, how did that enter into you? Well, it uh, it wasn't something that that I wanted to uh, to be um, connected to in in uh, in the beginning, so to speak. Yeah. Um, uh, well. So I, it goes back to obviously my my conversion experience. I uh, I was raised in uh, in Appalachia, uh, mm. southeastern Kentucky, uh, Corbin, Kentucky, to be exact, uh, home of the first KFC. So uh, that's there you uh, go. That's my hometown, the Colonel. Uh, the <laughs> Colonel. That's right. My uh, my mother's house, the house that I grew up in, is about two miles from the first KFC. Wow. And so um, I came to faith when I was in the um, in the ninth grade. And uh, the backstory behind that is just a, just a, a, an interesting journey of how the Lord works through social networks uh, mm-hmm. to bring people to faith. Um, uh, but it was through an invitation of a sixth grade teacher three years prior uh, to my mother and I. I grew up, my parents were divorced uh, when I was three. I grew up with my mom and see dad on the weekends. But a uh, sixth grade teacher invited, invited us to his congregation and uh, mom started going and she joined the church. And then three years later, I, I came to faith through the ministry mm-hmm. of that church. But then when I became a junior in high school, um, I really began to sense that the Lord was leading me into pastoral ministry. Mm-hmm. And man, that that scared me. I did not want I didn't want anything to do with that, brother. I I ran from that. I came up with uh, with some alternative plans for God. Uh, yeah. get, you know, he he needed a plan B because uh, his plan A was not 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 a really good choice for him. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> what I, the, the finger of the Holy Spirit, man, the finger of the Holy Spirit just continued to press farther and farther down on my shoulders, mm. and I was I felt like I was just crawling, you know, in the dust. Mm. I was miserable, um, and I realized one day that if I keep going in, the, well, first of all. One, if Jesus is Lord of my life, I cannot say no to him. Yeah. And two, if I keep going in this direction, one day I might wake up in the belly of a big fish. Mm. And so <laughs> I, I, man, I remember where I was, when I was, what was going on, uh, when I repented of all that uh, rebellion. Yeah. And uh, it was instantly uh, the, just the, the, the little finger of the Holy Spirit was just lifted off my mm. shoulders and just a great sense of peace and and rest, not knowing what that would bring in the future. And so um, at that point in time, it was it was very much be involved in pastoral ministry. And that, even though I've been in academia for, uh, at this point in time, 23, I think about 23 years uh, in a variety of different settings, uh, 19 years have been uh, in, in pastoral uh, ministry. And so, um, so that's my, you know, that's my calling. It's how I'm wired in that Ephesians 4.11 pastor teacher concept. Yeah. But I started pastoring uh, shortly uh, after after college, and my wife and I we got we got married. We graduated on one Saturday, got married the next Saturday, and while we were on our honeymoon, first church called called me to be their pastor. <laughs> wow! And and then that fall, I started going to seminary. So I was halfway through my seminary studies. I sensed that the Lord was leading me into uh, doctoral studies and that he wanted me to keep one foot in the field and one foot in the classroom and begin to train leaders 
not only in and through the local church, but also at, at an academic mm-hmm. uh, level as well. And so I was just trying to burn through my master of divinity studies as quickly as I could to get into doctoral studies. And so once one summer, I needed to take a three hour evangelism elective. And the only thing that was being offered that summer was a class called Introduction to Church Planting. Hmm. And it was by a visiting professor. His name was Charles Brock. And I didn't know who this guy was. I went to one of my professors at the at the seminary and I said, uh, who is this guy? Should I take this class? And and I remember uh, my professor saying, oh, you'll like him. He's a great guy. He's, he spent 20 years as a church planner in the Philippines has a ministry called uh, uh, Church Growth International here in uh, the States. He does a lot of training in North America and throughout the world. And so, you know, my thinking at this point in time was that I'm a pastor. Church planting's not, I mean, it's, yeah, okay, it's it's important. Yeah. It's just not that significant. Yeah. Um, my concept is uh, let's just keep growing one church larger and larger and larger and larger until Jesus comes back. And, um, and really, you know, missions is important, but it's, you know, it's just not, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's just not all that, so to yeah. speak, from my perspective. So we get halfway through this class, and the Lord spins me in a completely different direction mm. that I never saw coming. Uh, he shifted my thinking ecclesiologically. He shifted my, he shifted my thinking in, in basically what is the church? What does yeah. it mean to be the church? Uh, who should be a part of the church, what is the church supposed to do? He shifted my thinking in the concept of, of church planting, um, where it, it became a very strong consuming aspect of my, my desires to see accomplished among the, uh, the unreached of the world. Uh, it, it, that class just transformed everything. In fact, brother, we wouldn't even be having this conversation yeah. right now if it had not been for that one uh, two-week class that Charles Brock uh, taught. Charles passed away just a few years ago, mm. but um, but that's that set yeah. me, you know put me on that trajectory into missions. And so, so over the next several years, um, I began to to uh, to begin to write, research, train, study, work with um, church planners at a variety of levels. I was uh, served on church planning teams. But still, in that pastor teacher role to come alongside others to train them, equip them you yeah. know, to to be be doing that work, and and even to this day, you know that's kind of where I am. But it all it all started with that that calling to Christ back in Corbin, yeah. Kentucky, calling in the pastorate, and then that one class, mm. and and that's that's where that's where we are today. Yeah, I you know I think there's there's a couple of of really good things uh, in your story one you, you talked about you know the lordship of Jesus in your life um, and if Jesus really is Lord um, you're gonna actually follow what he says um, mm-hmm. you know let's let's dive in, into that as the importance of Jesus as Lord in especially in, in our churches and church planting in new believers of what that actually looks like. Um, that concept to continue to further the Great Commission. Well, I was I was very thankful that even though I was a part of a church that didn't have church planting on its on its radar, and and missions was was something that was really seen as exceptional. You know, we yeah. would, we would give our annual financial gifts, and then every now and then we would have missionaries to come and speak. But that was about all. Yeah. Um, I was thankful that I had a congregation that really instilled within all of us uh, the, basically the spiritual disciplines, that if Jesus is Lord, then we need to be in his word, we need to be reading scriptures, we need to be quick to confess our sins, um, we, need, we need accountability, and there was a very high priority placed on um, personal evangelism, and so being involved in, in sharing your faith, I mean, I remember I remember when I was when I was 15, I was looking forward to getting my driver's license at 16 so that on Thursday nights I could go out uh, visiting with the men of my church that would go out on Thursday nights yeah. and basically do visitation. And so just those basic aspects of what it means to follow Christ and to to learn to die to self and, and be filled with the spirit. Those were really instilled within me through through a healthy local congregation, 
even though in those areas, even though there were some other areas mm. where, where I think they were, they were falling short. Yeah. Have you seen uh, uh, that aspect, you know, when you're thinking about missions and, and contextualization, um, looking at, you know, how do we actually follow Jesus in a different culture? Um, yeah. What, what relevance of the Lordship of Jesus plays into contextualization and missions? Yeah. You know, and I, and I never really thought about that much until really until I started going to seminary and, yeah. and then I encountered professors that had been on the field and were, were you know, were, were, were teaching at that level. So, so I kind of came for me, the, the, that walk in that direction kind of came from the top down. And that's why I, I try to train others, especially pastoral leaders to, to be instilling, you know, the questions that you're asking and, yeah. and how we should respond to those instilling those within their church membership. But the way that to answer your question, you know, when I look at a passage like, you know, first Corinthians chapter nine, you have Paul and, um, and he, and he's, he's uh, Paul and Barnabas and his team, um, that's come into Corinth and Paul's now writing, uh, uh you know, this letter yeah. back to the church. And it, and he's talking about all these rights as an apostle that he has given up. He and Barnabas um, for financial support, to, uh, the right to take along a believing wife with them, and and he he says, you know, other apostles, you know, that they, they have these rights, but we've given we've given these things up, and he he pushes farther into that chapter, and he says, I'm doing what I'm doing so that I can become all things to all people, so that I may may save some. Yeah. And and and, and <clears throat> excuse me, and in that context, he's talking about reaching Jews and Gentiles. So I think when you when you think about the lordship of Christ in our lives. That notion of what Paul was talking about, uh, sometimes giving up our own rights and areas of comfort uh, to reach people, yeah. to cross those cultural gaps, to reach them where they are, n not to get them to try to come to my safety comfort zone, but how can I how can I reach them where they are? How can I think about sort of Philippians two, you know, that passage where Christ empties Himself, you know, and takes mm -hmm. on the form of a servant. Uh, for me, when I think about crossing cultural gaps to engage others in light of the Lordship of Christ, it it's it really is to take on that mindset of being that servant yeah. and recognizing that just because I can do something, just because I have a right to do something, doesn't necessarily mean that I should do that yeah. for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, and I think I think that's a, a big struggle when people are crossing cultures and. You know, as you're you're looking, I think we cross cultures uh, every day in the United States yeah. um, that we're we're interacting cross culturally. So, you know, when I'm thinking cross cultural uh, work for the for the advancement of of Jesus's uh, kingdom, it's not just a as a, a Westerner I'm going to go somewhere else in the world. There's actually a lot of cross cultural. Um, interactions that I have now, like mm -hmm. you and I come from very different backgrounds in the United States. You know, I grew up in the Seattle area. You grew up in Corbin, Kentucky. There's uh, there's probably a lot of cultural differences that we have that we actually Maybe have to one cross. one or two differences. <laughs> yeah, that we have to cross cultures, right? Yeah, so I actually right. have to figure out what is the love language that you have um, where, you know, what happened with your culture growing up and where are you coming from and what are the the eyes, the motivations that you have so that I could be able to actually, we could actually speak the same language. Mm -hmm. What are some, some good ways that you have found to help people speak the same language with others so that our communication is not uh, different and not effective? Yeah. And I, I think you, you know, you bring up an amazing point and that is the, the issue of, we, we should think about crossing cultural gaps more like a spectrum. Yeah. You know, it's it's not it's not necessarily a radical leap from me to someone else. It could be. Mm -hmm. But in some cases that, you know, that that leap of crossing cultural gaps could be much smaller, such as someone from you know the southeastern part of the United States engaging someone from the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, uh, that's you know, that's one <laughs> leap. Another leap is, you know, someone from southeastern Kentucky engaging someone from, you know, North Africa, from Morocco or something yep. like that. So. What I try to help people understand is is really a couple of things. Uh, one, the issue of understanding who they are, and how they think, and how they process things, and and simultaneously the people that they're they're seeking to engage, seeking that they're they're, they're seeking to reach. Who are those people? You know, understanding them 
um, for, from their, you know, what, what are their hurts, their fears, yeah. their joys, their passions, you know, who are they demographically, who are they spiritually, you know, really beginning to think about, you know, what's their history, what's, what are their political views, and then watching your language, that's the second thing, watching your mm -hmm. language, recognizing that, that we may use biblical terms sometimes, but that may not communicate with the person you know, that we're seeking to connect with and engage with because of those cultural gaps. They, they may not be from the same background. And so let's, maybe instead of using the, the, the words, we, we, we define the, you know, what we're trying to express. Um, or if we do use the words, we explain, you know, what, what we're saying to mm -hmm. someone and, and yeah. not assuming. I mean, I mean, like even today, you can't, you can't talk about God with someone without, you know, wondering, what is this person thinking when I say God? Are they yeah. thinking what God? Is there a God? Which yeah. one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. You know, and so, so we just we really have to be what David Hesselgrave. David Hesselgrave was a professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity mm -hmm. School. He, he wrote a book called Communicating Christ Cross Culturally. Uh, you know, it's about five trillion pages long, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, big old book. He said we need to be receptor oriented in our communication. In other words, as I'm speaking to someone, I need to, to simultaneously put myself in their shoes and yeah. be asking, how are they receiving mm. what I'm saying? And that to me has been a, a very helpful thing over the years. I still make mistakes. Yeah. yeah. I still make mistakes. <laughs> um, I still, I still, uh, you know, say, th say things at a level that communication breaks down breaks down you know in and things of that nature but i, tr I try i try <laughs> yeah we all make mistakes yeah yeah yeah. we all do that uh that's good i mean you just wrote a, a book on you know apostolic pa imagination uh mm -hmm. yes it just came out you know when we're you're thinking of apostolic imagination what is your what is your aim uh to help us get into a, that this mindset it um the book is really uh it's really a call to, to, to a paradigm shift. It's a book that um, I've written several books by God's grace over the years, but this one has been the longest in the making. Mm. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and, it, and it's really calling for a paradigm shift, and, it, and it's, it's calling us to rethink um, a great deal of what we say and how we do this thing called missions. Yeah. And so rethinking just the language that we use, rethinking, you know, missionary identity and priority and where we go and to whom and what's the role of the church in the West and how are pastors and how should pastors be, be involved. But for me, the apostolic imagination is, is trying to get us to, to go back to the to the first century and ask the question, what was that, that mental framework, that mindset yeah. uh, that came obviously out of their theology um, for why they did what they did when it came to the notion of evangelism and disciple and teaching people uh, obedience and planting churches and raising up leaders and uh, caring for churches and, and partnering with churches. You know, what, what was that mindset? Hmm. Um, I tell a, I tell a <laughs> funny story in the beginning of the book to kind of, kind of set the tone for the book and it's 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 kind of embarrassing but um uh, but i'll just we'll just keep this between you and me right <laughs> yeah just you and me nobody yeah, else will hear it no one else will hear this so. <laughs> um so i i was i was a professor at southern seminary in louisville kentucky uh for 10 years and um and i had driven the route back and forth we had an extension site in nashville tennessee i'd driven that route from nashville to louisville straight shot on interstate 65 uh I've, I've, I've driven the route 20 or 30 times yeah um but one day i was in birmingham alabama where i actually am right now and uh i was leaving birmingham i'd been in some some really exciting meetings of some things that the lord was doing and it would actually be a part of that process of me uh, coming to serve as one of the pastors with the church at brook hills and it was about 6 p.m. that night. I got on the road, and I was driving up Interstate 65. Three hours later, I would get to Nashville. It was 9 o'clock at night. Uh, three hours later, I'd be in Louisville and hopefully in bed by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and then up for teaching the next morning. Well, I was, I was excited about the conversations that I just had. I, was, I had called my wife. I was talking to my wife. I'd called my, my pastor and was talking with him and just all kinds of things going on in my mind. I was spending time with the Lord. And when I got to Nashville, it was dark. There was construction going on downtown. And to this day, brother, I do not know how this happened. 
But instead of staying on Interstate 65, I got on the interstate that leads west mm. out of Nashville. <laughs> and I wish I could say, you know, oh, I, you know, I caught it. This was the time before uh, smartphones. I yeah. did not have a smartphone. I didn't have a Garmin GPS to <laughs> sit on my dashboard. Yeah. I had MapQuest printout copies, yeah. you know, back in, <laughs> back in the day. And here's the thing. I drove over two hours before wow. I realized I was going in the wrong direction. Now, I was moving forward. I was yeah. making some kind of progress. I was doing good things in my drive, thinking yeah. and processing and planning for class the next day and things of that nature. But while I was doing all these good things, I wasn't where I needed to be doing what I needed to do, moving in the direction that I needed to go. Yeah. And I think that that story kind of reflects where, generally speaking, evangelicals are right now. We're doing yeah. some great things around the world. We're moving in a, you know, in, in good directions, but I think we've lost a great deal of focus. And I think that over time we are, we're on an interstate moving mm -hmm. in a different direction than what we should be moving in. Yeah. So what, what focus is that? What, what direction should we be moving in? Well, it, the, the reality is, is that when we think about this thing called missions, we, we have to acknowledge something that we rarely talk about. Uh, Michael Stroop recently started talking about this in, in a book that just came out. And that is the issue of the language of mission. I mm -hmm. mean, for example, you know, mission, missions, missionary, missional, they're, they're all extra biblical words. Yeah. And, and they really begin to be applied in the, in the sense that we know them today in the 16th century as a result of the work of uh, Loyola and his application of it to the Jesuits. And, that, and tied in with that was a great deal of colonial expansion and military expansion and, um, and merchants you know, going throughout the world. And, and so we really have taken these extra biblical terms and tried to find biblical support for these terms. And when you begin to do that, you can often lead to some unhealthy uh, understandings. You can yeah. lead to, to healthy understandings. Uh, extra biblical terminology is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, Trinity, for example, is, right. is extra biblical. But if we're not careful, we can go in an unhealthy direction with our identity and then out of that with functions and things of that nature. Right. And so where we find ourselves today is that in the church, there is among evangelicals, the majority, of uh, there is no sense of priority for what right. the church should be doing when it comes to this thing called missions, because everyone's got their own definition right. of what missions is and who's a missionary. Are we all missionaries? Just the yeah. few that go to other countries. And, and so because of that, we find ourselves at a time whereby we can be doing missions and not even sharing the gospel. Hmm. And so this book is really trying to help us think about shifting things on a systemic level yeah. uh, in many, many different directions to yeah. line us in the way that I think we need to, to line up with the scriptures. Yeah, I, I'm, I was meeting with a, a missions pastor yesterday, I had lunch with a missions pastor, and uh, you know, he was like, so what's one thing that, that missions you know, pastors and the churches with missions departments gets wrong? What's the sticking point? And, you know, my answer, I don't know if it's the right answer or a good answer, but I said, if, you know, if ever, if we conflate missions and service, if we say that missions is service, then everything is missions. And we actually don't actually see the apostolic nature of what this church should be. Mm -hmm. The kingdom right. should be as we're extending the kingdom. So we actually, I think a lot of people conflate service and missions in a way that's not very helpful because we're all called to be servants and we're all called to, you know, help the poor and the needy, right. clothe the naked, you know, visit the prisoners. Like that right. that's what we're called to do, but that's not the apostolic nature of the church. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I think you, you're exactly right. Um, and, and so we didn't get to this point, you know, overnight. I mean, yeah. and it's been a long time coming, but, but I mean, if you think about this for a second, when, when you, when you come out of say the 16th century, the church really does not get serious about developing a theology of mission until the 20th century. I mean, mm. we're, we're not even 100 years deep into this. Mm. So, so the concept, for example, I mentioned a moment ago of Trinity, it's extra yeah. biblical, but, but think about the centuries of deep 
biblical support behind that concept. Yeah. Um, but with mission, we're not even 100 years into significant, you know, theological substance behind it. And so what you have when you come out of you know, the Reformation time period and, and pietism, where there's this great zeal of mm. people going into the world and, and, and preaching the gospel, you know, 200 years of Protestant missionary work, people were incredibly zealous. They sacrificed great things to go to the nations, and they lost their lives. They lost, you know, they gave up resources, and and they were using the terms, you know, mission, missions, yeah. mi you know, missionary. But then when you begin to ask them about what's your biblical support, it was often proof texting. And so mm. it was, you know, Matthew 28 here, you know, go and make disciples. It was, you know, go and, you know, preach the gospel to all nations. It was an Acts 1-8, you know, be my witnesses. And those are all great, and they're fine. Yeah. But but there's a lot more to God's mission than that. So the church continues to grow throughout the majority world in these 200 years of Protestant missionary movement from about, you know, up until about 1910. Mm. And, and because of that growth in the majority world church, the European, generally European, uh, German particular, particularly, theologians began to say, hey, maybe we need to think about this thing that's been happen happening practically throughout the world. And church leaders were saying, hey, look at all this growth and look at what's happening. Well, the theologians begin to go back to the scriptures. Again, taking that same extra biblical terminology, they go back to the scriptures and they begin to say, well, mission is the mission of God, that concept, missio dei. And it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the church. Yeah. And what the church engages in in the world is missions. And because God is involved in many things, not just the redemption of individuals, mm -hmm. not just seeing people come to faith in Christ uh, and churches planted, which is really the, the primary understanding of, of many that went for 200 years. It's about evangelism. It's about church planning. It's about developing indigenous yeah. leadership. The theologian said, because God's involved in a variety of things, working toward the redemption of all things and the restoration of creation, therefore the church is to be involved in a variety of things. Mm. God's mission is broad. The church is to be involved in broad acts. And so therefore everything's equivalent, mm. you know, everything's equal. Yeah. And so to get back to your point, I know it's a long story, but there's a historical precedence here. And that is now we see, you know, evangelism and service and care for the environment and care right. for those that are in human trafficking. It's all equivalent. Yeah. And that's where we find ourselves right yeah. now. My neighbors next door sounds like they're having a party. <laughs> so, um, if you're wondering why all the laughter and stuff's happening, I'm, I'm in my <laughs> office and my colleague next door sounds like in his tiny closet of an office, he has like 700 people in there or something. Well, like that's that, good. So. He's having a party. He's excited about what you're saying, what you're <laughs> yeah. talking about. He's I should have been on the wall telling the me miss your day, what The God's mission on earth, you know? Like, wh why wouldn't he be, have a party with that? <laughs> If only he was listening to me. I don't think he's listening to me. <laughs> uh, probably not. So what, you know, if if right now we're at the stage where, you know, everything is missions, what are the what are the things that we need to get back to? What's this apostolic imagination we need to get back to? Well, I think part of it is to ask the question, um, wh where do we even get this? You know, if, if we operate on the concept of, of the language of mission, yeah. is there any, where's the equivalent? Um, in the in the in the Bible for this concept of being sent, going into the world, being mm -hmm. sent, because that, that's really what it means. Yeah. And and I think we have to acknowledge that it comes back to the apostolos, the apostle, if you yeah. will. And then we need to begin asking questions. Well, okay, if that's the case, because you know you don't see the words missionary in the Bible, and I know some people have basically equated missionaries with evangelists. I, I'm familiar with that as well. But I think in the New Testament. <clears throat> excuse me, those that were, <clears throat> sorry, um, those that were, were sent were those that, you know, em embraced that notion of apostolos. Yep. And so if that's the case, then you have to ask questions such as, well, what did they do, mm -hmm. you know, when they went, you know, what, what were they engaging in and, and were there certain functions? And I think that there were at least six functions. Hmm. Um, did they give a priority to anything? And I would say, yeah, I think that they did. I mean, you know, for example, Acts chapter Chapter six, you know, you, the, the church in Jerusalem is growing, and there's this uh, there's this uh, disagreement, this dispute that comes up with the w food distribution between the Hebraic widows yeah. and Jewish widows, and the apostles are called in to oversee this work, and they they are handling it for a while, but they basically say we're neglecting the mm -hmm. preaching of the word, which would have primarily been evangelism in the highways and hedges, and prayer, and 
it's not that they said, hey, this is a worthless, you know, ministry, yeah. you know, we shouldn't be, no one should be doing this, that it's not important. It's, yeah. they basically said, get, get some people together. They get seven people together and they turn this ministry over to them. And then what's fascinating, and there are scholars out there that disagree with me on this because they would say, well, well, it's still saying that everything's equivalent. It just basically means that what was the most important for the apostles was preaching and prayer. And what was the most important for those seven servants was the food distribution. But, but I don't think that's the point in the text, because if you look at the very next passage, the very next verse that Luke moves on to, yeah. he's recording how the gospel now continues to spread mm. and advances and disciples multiply yeah. as a result of the freeing up of the apostles. Mm. So much so that even the most resistant people at this point in time, the priests, were then coming to faith. Hmm. So I, I think part of that journey is for us to go back and ask, what was the apostolic elements and yeah. aspects of what the church was engaged in in the first century, and then begin to think in terms of what, what does that look like for us today? Yeah. And, and if we go down that route, I think it will affect us on, on many different levels uh, in, in very good ways. Yeah. So that's, that's really good. Uh, so you know, for example, right now we've, you know, our our church planting work, say in the in the U.S., is we're continually building more congregations, churches. Um, the the rate of of uh, people following Christ is going down. Uh, it's not even keeping up with <laughs> congregational church planting. Um, and so, is there a different church planting strategy that we need to have? That's not actually impacting bringing people to Christ. You know, this mm -hmm. church planting strategy may be a little bit off at the moment. So what are some of those things that we need to to figure out to, to get on the right track so that more people can say yes to Jesus? He's my mm -hmm. Lord. I want to live all of life uh, in right. service to him. Right. Um, let me make this preface before I before I answer your question. And, just, and I know I'm being redundant here, but keep in mind a pastor is saying this. All right. So, so yeah. I, want, I want you, I want everyone to hear that and understand that where I'm coming from. Um, but you're exactly right. Our our model, our power, our paradigm, I would say, is significantly out of focus. Yeah. Um, so let's think about this for a second. So our our primary approach today is is starting with a pastor that we also call a church planter who goes and seeks to gather together long-term kingdom citizens to organize them together and self-identify as a local expression of Christ's universal body and for them to be missional to be evangelistic you know in their local community and throughout the world yeah you can plant churches that way. We do. I've trained people to do that. I've been a part of church planting teams that have done that. I've, I've served as an elder in churches uh, that, that we've done that. I'm not anti that. I'm not yeah. opposed to that at all. So, so everyone, you know, please hear that. But I have to then ask the question, because if I'm, if I'm thinking about an apostolic imagination, I have to say, well, where is the biblical support for this, this concept that we call church planting, and of course, you know, church planting is extra biblical terminology. But but what what's the biblical support? Yeah, what does that look like? And I would submit that the biblical model is the reverse, the exact mm -hmm. opposite of our predominant approach in mm -hmm. uh, the United States, in yeah. Canada, and in many Western countries today. So, for example, you look at Acts chapter thirteen and fourteen, and what do you see? Well, the the the, the, the teams. The apostolic teams, they go into a community and they, they do evangelism. So they're sowing the seed, they're, they're preaching yep. the gospel, and, and then disciples are made. So they, they come to faith in Christ. They turn from their sin, they place their faith in Christ. And, and then the disciples are, are gathered together in those local cities to be the local expression of Christ's universal body, and they call them churches, they, yeah. you know, the ecclesia. But what is fascinating, particularly at the end of the first missionary journey, is that after Paul and Barnabas go through all these towns, they preach the gospel, they've made many disciples, it says that they turn around and they backtrack to go all the way back to the church in Antioch in Acts 13 that sent them out. Mm -hmm. It says they went back and they strengthened the souls of the disciples, and they appointed elders for them in every church. Yeah. Um, Paul tells Titus in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, the reason I left you on Crete was to put what remained in order and appoint elders in every yep. town. So 
you know, what do you see as far as the apostolic paradigm? It's the, the apostolic teams were, were scaffolds. They were not permanent fixtures yep. uh, to the work, and they were working to phase themselves out and raise up pastoral leaders for those churches. So you don't talk about pastors until you talk about churches, mm. and, you, and you don't have churches <laughs> until you have disciples. You don't have disciples until you have evangelism. Yeah. And I would say we're we're doing mm. the reverse of that, the opposite of that. Yeah. And and it's not like this is 50-50. It's not like, okay, we're doing 50% plant yeah. and pastor, 50% apostolic you know, approach in, in North America. If if two to three percent of our church planning activities in the United States are apostolic, I would be shocked. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think about you think about any book, yeah. any conference you go to on church planning, um, it it is a plant and pastor paradigm. And I would say there's a place for that, but if almost everything we do is that particular paradigm and yeah. the gravity of the New Testament is in a different realm, yeah. maybe, we, maybe we've got an issue. Mm. That's good. I tell you, yeah, I'll tell you where, where this really kind of surprised me one time. Um, uh, shortly after I came to Birmingham, um, I, I, I came, the Lord called me as, to be one of the pastors of the church at Brook Hills that I mentioned a moment ago, and I was overseeing our, our church multiplication training and uh, pastoral training as well. And, um, and I, I had a, had a meeting with a guy who had been involved in planting a lot of churches. And he said, JD, I just want to hear your vision for what, you know, you're hoping to lead, you know, Brook Hills to be involved in. And I basically described what I just said, you know, said to you about this apostolic approach, yeah. Acts 13, 14, Titus chapter one, verse five. And when, when I was done, he, he looked at me, first of all, he had this deer in the headlight look. <laughs> and then he, he said, he said, that is fascinating he said that's amazing that's wonderful and and i know he the brother was trying to encourage me so, so I, you know <laughs> hear my heart on this i know he was trying to encourage me but what troubled me was that he he was responding as if i had created something novel mm -hmm. as if i was being innovative and i've come up with something new and it hit me it, it hit me that when a biblical model shocks us mm -hmm. It shows us just how far away we've moved from yeah. a biblical model. Yeah, and I think that that's where we are, and I think we need to return to to an apostolic imagination because our imagination right now, when it comes to engaging in these great commission tasks, is primarily a pastoral imagination. Yeah, and that's great where the church is established. Yeah, but where you're talking about unreached people groups you really have to function in a, in a more apostolic way. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, you know, the work that we're trying to do, uh, you know, at all nations, we're trying to have that, that apostolic heart to go into unreached people groups, uh, and to figure out a way to do that. Right. How do we mm -hmm. actually find open hungry people for the gospel, yeah. make disciples, gather them in churches, raise up local leaders, elders, and then, you know, coach from behind, raise mm -hmm. people up and try to get out of there. Um, and that's great. That's so good. And, you know, that's that's been our, our model, what we're trying to do. It's not easy. You know, it's it's a difficult thing to do, but God is faithful in the midst of it. Um, and f for us to be able to actually go and I don't think that's possible unless Jesus is Lord of your right. life. I don't think it's possible if we have just a Jesus as savior mentality mm -hmm. um, it, because, you know, that's what it's going to take. Everything of me, yeah. I have to give to this. Um, and, you know, it's also going to be lonely. Uh, and it's also you're not the, the star of the show. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's hard for some people. Um, yeah. yeah. So this has been been rich. This has been really good and very helpful to help us figure out, okay, where are we at now um, with missions, with church planting, um, and where we need to go? I have just a couple of questions here at the end. Mm -hmm. one, yes. one is, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? I would say give up the dream of being uh, an 80s hard rock guitarist in the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were already too late for that dream. You're already well, too late. you know, and, and and that dream <laughs> pops up every now and then. I have to remind myself it's not the '80s anymore, uh, and I don't play guitar as much as I used to. Everything, <laughs> everything that's been comes back around, though, right? Yeah, no, no the, the, the you know, seriously, in, in answer to your question, um, you know, I, I think, I think, 
part of what I would go back to say is, um, you know, you know, you know, the scripture tells us that we're to act justly and love mercy mm -hmm. and, and walk humbly, you know, with our God, constantly reminding myself, you know, to do that, yeah. um, constantly reminding myself to be, to be a learner mm. and, and then to, to recognize that there will be people along the journey that, um, that will, will tell you at times you can't do this or you can't do that because mm -hmm. you're not this or you're not that. Yeah. But if, but if God has called you, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll bring you along on that journey mm -hmm. and not to allow some of that criticism to, to weigh, yeah. you know, too heavily on you. So walk humbly, but at the same time, recognizing that, mm -hmm. you know, the Lord, you know, the Lord is the one who's, who's moving you forward. Um, yeah. There, you know, someone always has to be the first to get to Philippi. Yeah. You know, someone always has to be the first to, you know, to take the gospel to this place or that place. And if we always said, well, you know, we can't do that or you can't do that because you've never done it before mm. and you never would do anything. Yeah, that's right. So I think those would be some of the big things, mm -hmm. um, you know, that I would remind myself of. Yeah. If I could go back. Um, that's so good. Do that. Yeah. It's hard not to listen to the critics. It is hard not to listen to the critics. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh that, that's that's true. It, it, you know, especially within the church, you know, yeah. you know, unbelievers are one thing. Yeah. But then but. You know, but then even though, you know, they're brothers and sisters in the Lord at the same time, sometimes they lack tact and grace and um, <laughs> kindness. Yeah. 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 Uh, anything you've been reading uh, lately that you could recommend? Man, I um, I am so uh, focused right now on uh, my my next book <laughs> that all all I've been doing is researching for that right now. Mm. And so, um, so even though uh, Apostolic Imagination uh, came out, and then uh, my theology of of mission book uh, just came out a, a week after that one, uh, you'd think I'd, I'd stop and take a break, <laughs> but um, I'm not. I'm doing. I'm working on on another book um, right now on on evangelism, and so I'm reading yeah. a lot of a lot of different authors from a lot of different perspectives on on that topic. So. Um, so that's what I'm immersing myself in at this point in time. I mean, there, you know, there's some good, there's several excellent books that are out there, uh, on, on this topic that I've been reading. I mean, like right here on my desk, um, you know, I've, I've got a book by Jay Moon and Bud Simon, Effective Intercultural Evangelism. I just finished that. I just finished, uh, Scott Hildreth and Steve McKinnon's book, Sharing Jesus Without Freaking Out. I know some of these have been around for a little while. Uh, Sam Chan's book, Evangelism in a Skeptical World. Uh, you know, you know, these are, things that are right now on my my reading yeah. list but i'm kind of immersing myself into that world right now but that's great that, that's that's what's going on yeah it needs to happen it's good um yeah so your theology of missions book um apostolic imagination where can people find those where can people find your work how how can they connect with you yeah so you know wh wherever you purchase your fine reading materials <laughs> you'll, yeah. be able to find, you'll be able to find those not your junk reading materials it's not, <laughs> so, it's not there yeah. you, can, you can get it at amazon walmart barnes and noble target all that um uh but um but yeah you, you know you can you can track me down i'm out there on on social media easy to find uh, jdpain.org is my my blog site um i have a podcast called strike the match i have a youtube channel uh, just JD Payne at YouTube. You search me there, and you can find me. Um, and so I I write quite a bit about these topics we're, we've mm. been talking about today. Yep. And uh, I've got videos I've been doing on these topics and podcasts on these topics. And so really easy to easy to locate out there. Yeah. Well, JD, it was a a pleasure to talk to you. It was really really good. I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for coming on. Well, it's been an honor being with you, brother. Thank you for your great kingdom work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could 
actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.